will be baptised next week. Praise God. Praise God. Well, that's a good start. Okay. Um, I don't want any of you falling asleep while I speak, please. Just let's get ourselves motivated. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Um, and it was interesting because when Pastor gave us our brief um, about what what about preaching, um, baptism was what he told us we need to focus on. And the two things, two words came to my head as soon as he said that, and that was mikvah, and I'll explain what that is, and the eunuch who was passing, the Ethiopian, who was passing along and Philip went to speak to. And that was immediate. So I'm going with that leading. Amen. Amen. Yeah. You know, baptisms are a holy, joyous event. Yes. And they're sacred. That's right. Well, when you think about it, Jesus, the Son of God, was baptised, right? Yes. And what happened when he was baptised? God immediately spoke and said, this is my son whom I love and with whom I am well pleased. Matthew 16, 17. So we know God recognises baptism and it affects God. Hallelujah. Amen. Now we've been hearing over the last few weeks from Pastor Enoch about all different aspects of baptism. And he's been highlighting lots of different things to us and for us. He's taken us through the word. He's shown us the importance of baptism as is spoken in the word. He's also showing the impact of baptism. And he says it's our duty, as the Word of God says in Matthew, it's our duty to go out and to make disciples of men. But not only that, but to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and to teach them. That is an order we've been given. And we can't do it without being baptised ourselves, right? Don't you just hate it when people <laughs> preach to you but don't act on what they're preaching themselves? There is effect. We need to understand what we're doing as Christians. But I want to take a slightly different angle today. But before I do, I also want to point out that Pastor Evangel preached on another aspect of baptism. Baptism of the water, the fire, and the power. There's three different aspects. You can go with just the water. Or you could go and sell yourself more, or open yourself up more and receive the fire. Or open yourself up even more and receive the power. We're told in 2 Corinthians, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And there are nine gifts. Let's go there. Um, I want to I see, I want you to see the power that we have and can have if we open ourselves up. So let's go to, sorry, it was 1 Corinthians 12, 8 to 9. In fact, Pastor Amanda already spoke about them today. Could have been in our prayer time actually. So it's 1 Corinthians, and I was very encouraged by that because I love it when we pray things out that God has already put in my heart because it's confirmation. 1 Corinthians 12, 8 to 9. And here it lives the different gifts of the Holy Spirit. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another the message of knowledge by means of the Spirit. To another gifts of healing. 
by that one spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another, the interpretation of tongues. Now this is loaded, and I have, I'm not going to go through it all today. Um, but there are divine gifts that we can receive if we press in. Baptism with water is just one stage. There are more. And the more you allow yourself to press in, the more you will be filled. And I'm saying that to all of you who are going to be baptised next week. It is opening a door for you to achieve heights that you couldn't even dream of if you press in. Okay. So, having heard so much already about baptism, I'm going to come to you from a different angle. I'm going to talk about baptism as part of the wedding of the Lamb. Now, <clears throat> I want to show you how baptism actually correlates with us as the brides of Christ and our wedding to the Lamb. Now, how many of you remember me preaching about the wedding of the Lamb weeks ago. It's about the Jewish wedding and the different phases. I'm glad some of you do. <laughs> uh, I want to show you, now we all know that Jesus was a Jew, right? So he would be very familiar with Jewish weddings and obviously one of the first miracles was at a wedding, right? Yes. Now, I want to show you how God is so great because we've been talking about the physical, spiritual, physical just now when we were doing communion. And God is showing us through the wedding, a Jewish traditional wedding, and I'm going to take you back in history, although some people, some sections of society, Jewish society, still practice this today, this type of wedding, and it consists of four phases. Okay, so Jesus will be very familiar with Jewish weddings. And when he preaches to us about joining him, about being part of him, he does it in a way that relates to a wedding. We've heard about the wedding feast, we've heard about the bride of Christ, etc., right? So he wants us to understand the different phases that we're going to which will culminate in the final phase of leaving and joining him in our new home. Amen. Amen. Okay. So, let's go to the first phase. Now the first phase of a Jewish wedding, how many of you have seen Fiddler on the Roof? I knew Lynn would have. Oh, you've seen it. Good. So um, there is there is an opening where you have the um, the lady that comes because she's going to arrange the marriage. You, there is a certain person you go through to arrange marriage. What I love, there is one line in top that Topol says in Fiddler on the Roof that I, I just can't help but smile at. And he says because he's he's had a really hard day. His horse is broken. Day. He's, he can't work anymore and pull his milk cart, so he has to do it himself. And he says, Lord, I know we are the chosen people, but can you not for one day choose somebody else? Yeah. <laughs> because we know as God's chosen people, we're going to be tested. Yeah. Look at Jesus. As soon as he was baptized, what happened? He was taken to the wilderness by the Holy Spirit and he was tested by the devil. We are going to be tested, but that's a good thing. Because it's through the testing that we learn about ourselves. We learn, do we learn anything when we do things well? We learn far more when 
we don't do things well. Yeah. Not that I'm encouraging you all to not do things well. But by our mistakes, we learn more. God tests us so that we can learn and improve and move forward. Okay. So, <clears throat> when Jesus <clears throat> gets baptised, he's taken to the wilderness and he's tested. I, was, I remember somebody saying, when you become a Christian and you get baptised, you think you're onto a liner going to heaven with all the bands playing, good food, wonderful life, lots of singing and dancing. But you're wrong. It's a battleship that we're on. And we're going to be battling all the way to heaven, right? But that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing because each time, each battle gives us victory. And we are assured of that victory. The Word of God assures us of our victory. Hallelujah. So each battle we know is only going to benefit us. It's hard to go through. There's no denying it. But we know that God is on our side. And He will not, and it says so in the Word of God, He will not give us more than we can cope with. Alright? So be, be assured. Okay, so back to a Jewish wedding. Phase one. This is called acceptance or mutual agreement. Now in the Jewish religion, when you arrange a marriage, the parties get to choose if they want to marry that person or not. Well, that's in fact, it's not in all cases, some people are fools, but you do have a choice. Okay? And um, you either do it by meeting the person, in which case all the families around you, you don't meet them on your own, or else you're shown photos. What you can tell from a photo, I don't know, but you basically rely on your parents because they know what they're doing and they would have checked it all out. So you have, as a first stage, a choice. Do you choose to receive that person as your partner? Okay. The second phase is called the mikvah. Now the mikvah is a ritual bath. And it's something that a bride does before she gets married. And in fact, a mikvah is used by both men and women, and I will explain more later, because it's important. It's important because it correlates with baptism, and we see that it forms part of the wedding ceremony. It's an important part of the, of the wedding ceremony. This is a ritual cleansing. So you're going to go into a marriage, which is important, and so you have to be ritually cleansed first. And then we go to the contract or the engagement. Now that takes place under a chuppah. It's out in the open. There is like a um, gazebo effect that you get married under. And what it is, is you both, and we do it in our weddings too, you both agree to terms of the wedding. You take your vows, right? And to seal that, we exchange rings, right? Or a ring is given. That is the seal. In the Jewish tradition, they also break a glass because that was to show that nothing can break the wedding, nothing can break the marriage. Because they break the glass instead. That's done, nothing else can interfere. Okay. So that's the third phase. It's called the engagement. But nowadays they put, they actually combine phase three and phase four. And phase four is the wedding feast. And the wedding feast is the party that everyone comes to, the big celebration of this union, when the husband collects the wife and takes him off to takes her off to the new home. So there's four phases. Now let's 
apply that to us as Christians? First of all, you have the acceptance. We know God chooses us, we don't choose him. But everyone is given an opportunity to choose Christ. Okay? The question is whether or not we take it. That's the first phase. The choice. Do you choose to receive him? The second phase is the baptism, the spiritual cleansing. You go in as the old man, you come out as a new man, spiritually cleansed, new body. Okay? The third is the contract. And we know if when you receive Christ and you get baptized, you then are given a seal of the Holy Spirit. That's the exchange of rings. The Holy Spirit is our seal. Ephesians 1.13 says, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, and believed. You were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. So you can see how it's correlating very nicely with the Jewish wedding, a traditional Jewish wedding. We are being married to Christ step by step. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, in John 14, 3 it says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may also be where I am. The fourth phase of the Jewish wedding. This does not take place immediately after the engagement. You get married under the chuppah, you exchange your vows, you receive your ring, you break your glass, but you do not go away with your husband. In the traditional Jewish wedding, which Jesus would have known, which was historical, because today they combine phase three and four, the groom goes away to his home and starts looking for a place for them to live. Meanwhile, the wife will go back to her parents' home and prepare for her home to be with the groom. And she goes away and she waits. She doesn't know when the groom is going to come and get her. She has to wait. And so she keeps her oil lamps burning. Does it stay the same? The ten virgins. Waiting for her husband to come and get her. Now, the husband cannot get his wife until his father gives him permission. This is in a traditional Jewish marriage, as Jesus would have known. When the father eventually gives the husband permission, which is usually about a year later, the husband, and usually in the evening, will come up with a grand procession following him, singing, dancing, celebrating to collect his wife who will be waiting for him to come and get her. And they go off together to their new home in celebration. Can you see the correlation between the traditional Jewish wedding and what Christ is telling us about our wedding feast to him? He will come back and take his bride with trumpets blasting. There will be joy. I don't know about you, but I sure will be happy. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. When he comes and takes us home. John 14, 3 says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may also be where I am. That's a promise. And that correlates beautifully.
beautifully with just how a Jewish traditional <coughs> wedding works. We are being married to Christ. Every phase we take is part of that ceremony. Hallelujah. Amen. So what I want to do now, because we're talking about baptism, is taking a closer look at phase two, the mikvah. In Jewish religion, that means a ritual bath. But this isn't a bath to cleanse yourself. You have to be clean before you get into the mikvah. Because this isn't about physical cleansing. This is about spiritual cleansing. So, I thank the Lord for Google. Because I went to Google to find out exactly what they say about a mikvah. I know what I understand, but I thought I would just check. And um, I went to this to, to there's Chabad, which is an organization, a Jewish organization, which explains all the traditions and all the ceremonies that uh, uh, the Jewish people have. And I went there and it says, a mikvah is a bath used for the purpose of ritual immersion in, Jews, in Judaism to achieve ritual purity. Now, you walk down into a deep bath and you're covered chest high. You're actually, you actually walk down. It's a big, deep, steep, square thing that you walk down. You are on your own. There's nobody else sharing this with you. It's not a public swimming pool. This is a bath. It's a big, square bath with steps going down and you go in and prayers are said. Okay. Now, most forms of ritual impurities can be purified through immersion in any natural collection of water. This is what the Jewish tradition is. However, some impurities require living water, such as springs and groundwater wells. Living water has the added advantage of purifying even while flowing, whereas rainwater is stationary to purify. So the mikvah was designed to simplify the process. Instead of having to go out and look for rivers or lakes or, or something with living waters with a ground spring, they actually created a mikvah. And this mikvah is created in such a way that there is constant living water flowing through it. Now the mikvah is considered to be important to a Jewish community, so important. This, this is considered, the ritual cleansing, spiritual cleansing, is considered so important that they actually build it before their synagogue. And they actually, if they haven't got enough money to build it, sell their most precious Torah rolls. I don't know, the, 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 the books, the five books, are on a Torah, and that is considered so precious, they've sacrificed their lives to protect their Torahs. And yet, they will sell a Torah in order to finance a mikvah, because it's considered so important. for a bath. As I explained to you, you have to go in clean before you can get into the mikvah. And a Jewish woman organization states, immersion in a mikvah has offered a gateway to purity ever since the creation of man. Now this is all taken from a Jewish perspective. The Midrash, which is a holy book, states that after being banished from Eden, Adam sat in a river that flowed from the garden. This was an integral part of his repentance process to return to his original perfection. And if you think about it, in Exodus 19.10, when God was going to appear to the Israelites, he told them, he told Moses to instruct the people to consecrate themselves for two days. 
That consecration is a cleansing. It's a mikvah. They to go and cleanse themselves spiritually and wash their clothes. So right through the importance of a spiritual cleansing is highlighted here. And baptism has the same merit. Baptism is a spiritual cleansing for us. To go in the old man and to come out the new. Spiritually cleansed. Hallelujah. Mark 16, 16 says, Whoever believes and is baptized, he will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. We need... Um, I haven't got time now to go through uh, the Ethiopian, but if you actually read... That account, and the account is in Acts 8, 26 to 40, you will see he goes through the th first three phases because he speaks to Philip, who explains to him the book of Isaiah he was reading. He receives Christ and wants to be immediately baptized in the river close by. And then goes away rejoicing. The whole event has been orchestrated by the Holy Spirit. So believe he's been sealed because he goes away rejoicing. Awaiting the fourth phase to appear. If you want to see the four phases, or certainly the first three, look at that account in Acts 8, 26-40. God's plan is perfect. He is showing us step by step the seriousness he takes our union with him. It's a marriage between us as his bride and Jesus as the groom. Hallelujah. Amen. So what I wanted to do just briefly is just pray for all those that are being baptised next week. Um, I don't know if they want to stand. Would that be... Possible for all those that are being baptized next week. Can you stand and let us pray for you? to surround them, Lord Father God, from this day forward, Lord, yes, Lord, that nothing, Lord Father God, will come in, Lord Father God, to disturb them. Nothing, Lord Father God, will affect them, Lord Father God. Yes, I pray that hedge of protection that Job knew, Lord Father yes, God, where he was protected from all evil. Yes, I thank you, Lord Father God. I pray your blessing upon them, each and every one of them, Lord. I pray, Lord Father God, that their hearts will be fully over to you, Lord, and that they will receive everything that you have for them. I pray they miss out on nothing that you have set aside for them. May they receive their full portions in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray the blood of Jesus over each and every one of them. From this day forward, Lord, have your way. Move in them in a mighty way. I pray for the gifts of the Holy Spirit to penetrate each and every one of them. May they walk in it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.